Okay, now here's a riddle for you. <laughs> a riddle. <laughs> the Riddler. <laughs> the Joker. Uh, here's a riddle for you. Now, who in tough economic times like we are now, you know, all the, you know, incomes are shrinking and the markets are tight and all this kind of stuff, who would you go to to ask for help, financial assistance for somebody? Would it be a rich guy or a poor guy? Oh, well, you would think it'd be the rich guy, but no, there's a big study that just came out showing the poor people are giving out more money <laughs> to charities and people who need extra money in tough, tough times than the rich people. <laughs> there's an organization called the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Now, what they do is track all this money that people give the charities, and they just came out with a big study by income. They went to the IRS, Internal Revenue Service, and looked at the income data from like 2006 to 2012. And it shows that if you were making more than $100,000 or you know, all the way up to a million, you gave less of your income to poor folks, to charities, you know, and even though your income was you know, increasing and actually the top income earners, uh, earners their income kept increasing in tough times, you know, in the last recession. <laughs> and even though their income was increasing, they gave out less to charity. Now, look at the other side, the poor people. Yeah, <laughs> like if you're making $25,000 or less, or 50,000 to 25,000, or 50,000 to 75,000, or 75,000, 100,000, all those categories, those people increased their giving as a percentage of their income that they made. So here are people making less money and increase the money they're giving to charities. People making more money are <laughs> shrinking how much they're giving to charities. You know, and that's why, man, you know, the data really tells you something, you know, and even though it goes against what you think would be logical, you know. Uh, another thing, they, they did this data by uh, county and zip code and um, city and state. In Las Vegas, which is one of the hardest cities hit in the recession, they really increased the most in their giving. I mean, it's just amazing. There's another study that really came out that studied the ultra rich. These are people who are <laughs> who have a net worth of over two hundred and forty million dollars, and their income certainly increased over the uh, uh, during the recession, and they actually decreased the amount of money that they gave to charity. You know? <laughs> so it, it, it's not only one source. And that kind of data anybody could get. See, that's available. That's public information. So if you Google now, you, you Google uh, IRS statistics of income, and it'll take you to the IRS website. Well, you could download all this data. I use it all the time. Like, I, I want to know, like, okay, uh, how much are we how much are rich people getting from Social Security? Like me, I mean, I don't need Social Security, you can find it. Uh, everything in your tax uh, form that you fill out, well, they categorize by income categories. So you could see, okay, uh, you know, someone making $50,000 or more, how much are they paying on their mortgage, how much are they give to charity, all those deductions. You could get it, and that's public information, uh, and that's sort of interesting. Now, also, information on charities. If you go and Google IRS and, and charities, you'll see all the public information on charity. Because if you're a nonprofit, if you're a charity or anything like that, you have, all your tax forms are public information. Anybody could get that. You know? <laughs> so you could see what the executives are making, how much they're spending on what, and all that is public information. And that's available from the IRS. So the IRS is good for some stuff. <laughs> That'd be helpful for you. <laughs> so keep watching that data. Do you realize that the government, the federal government, is collecting $105 million for you in refund money so you get a refund on some lousy underwear <laughs> that you were sold? That's right, underwear. This is the Federal Trade Commission. That's their job when consumers get ripped off to get the money back. See, you and I could fight some big company. It'll go nowhere, right? You're gonna hire a lawyer or all this kind of stuff. But no, the Federal Trade Commission could put these people 
out of business. <laughs> and look at this product. It's amazing. It's called eye pant. You know, like iPhone. Well, eye pant. Yeah, these are pants. They're underwear pants. Yeah, and it was big time apparently. I mean, look, I, I even found it still being sold at Nordstrom's. Yeah, you know, <laughs> $60 for this pants you know, and uh, underwear, actually, women's underwear that says it gets rid of cellulite. Now, here's what the spokesman said, says, you know, in the testimony and all the documentation of the Federal Trade Commission. The national spokesman for this company that makes it called uh, Wa Coal. W-A-C-O-A-L. He said, I always have to look my best, which for me means slipping into a shape <laughs> into a shaper as often as possible. I know that when I'm wearing wall coals shapewear, I always have a great silhouette. So in January, when Walcott introduced a revolutionary new eye pant with microfibers containing caffeine to promote fat destruction, vitamin E to promote the, uh, to prevent the effects of aging, and something else to restore and maintain the skin's smoothness. So this is your underwear that's going to get rid of your cellulite, <laughs> get rid of all the signs of aging and restore your skin to smoothness. This is underwear, something in the fibers they they put in. <laughs> and then she goes on to say, it was a love affair at first sight. <laughs> oh, it's incredible. Yeah. And it was even mentioned on, on MSNBC. Uh, and so it's been around. And so the, the, the FTC gets complaints. See, they don't know to uh, investigate any of this stuff until there's a complaint. So when there are uh, uh, enough complaints, hey, there's something wrong here, the big guns go out and, and, and you know, get justice in the world <laughs> and get your money back for that lousy underwear you got sucked into buying. You know, and now they just get came out... Um, with a press release saying how they got $1.5 million and they're going to get, get it back to customers. Uh, so stay tuned on the FTC because this just came out like uh, last week. But uh, another thing, you, when you have a complaint, that's why I think it's always good to complain. Somebody does something wrong. See, they're probably not only screwing you over, they probably did it to somebody else. So you have a chance to stopping that tidal wave, you know, <laughs> and stopping it earlier by complaining. And the FTC has a site where you could go uh, and complain. I mean, if you just put FTC complaint, and that's, you, that's the name of the site, ftccomplaint.gov. Uh, uh, yeah, ftccomplaintassistant.gov. But, uh, you know, if you Google FTC complaint, you'll get it. Or you could call 1-877-FTC-HELP. 1-877-FTC, that Federal Trade Commission, help do all those letters and the numbers on the phone and call. I mean, you putting in, it, it's your way to do something bigger in society and just say, ah, yeah, so I lost 60 bucks or whatever. But it's not that as you stops, you know, maybe hundreds of other people from losing 60 bucks because somebody's, you know, putting the wool over their eyes uh, and you have that power. And that's why, you know, some government agencies are so powerful. See, and these people, big businesses, you and I can't deal with them, <laughs> but the government can because they could put them on a business. So <laughs> that's better than any lawyer you have. A lawyer you're going to hire only could get your money back, you know, maybe some other thing. But God, that's why all companies are more afraid of some government agency that put all their business, you know, to be out of business instead of just your business. So use them. Well, if you know my work, you know I try to show people alternative sources of money and, you know, to do things in life. But I also show alternative sources of other things. And one of the things that interests me really is the law. I mean, we're a country of laws and, and we live in the greatest democracy in the world and we think, you know, you have to hire some lawyer at two, three hundred dollars an hour uh, to get justice, you know. But I, I don't think you do, you know, because there's alternatives to that. Like if, if any organization or business or something messes you over, there's probably a, a government agency that will fight for you <laughs> if you know where to ask. But they don't advertise, you know, on TV. They say, you know, if you have a phone, you have a lawyer, you know, and you're going to hire a lawyer and spend hundreds of dollars an hour, whatever it is, you know, and, and they have to go out and learn the law for you. Instead, you could... Talk to somebody who wrote the law and also enforces it, and they're more powerful than your attorney because they can put them out of business. 
Now, for issues that you have to fight the government, well, they're the nonprofit organizations, you know, and because there's a lot of nonprofits, again, they won't have advertising money. Tell you, you know, <laughs> you have a phone, you have a lawyer, you have to find them. So, like this, uh, the Ferguson incident, you know, in Missouri, the young man that was shot by police. So, how do you know your rights? You know, when the police come up to you, you know, well, you could go to them. It's ACLU.org. And what they have is a Know Your Rights pamphlet and information and everything. And it's for Know Your Rights about anything. Like if you're stopped for questioning, stopped in your car, you know, question about your immigration status. Well, what are your rights? Even if you're, you're, you don't have papers, you still have rights living here. You know, if you're approached by police or immigration agents at home, what are your rights? Or you're contacted by the FBI, if you're arrested, you're taken to immigration you know, custody. Or if you feel your rights have been violated, what do you do? Well, they have all kinds of help there and they have offices and actually they're in like 50 states now. They have uh, over 200 full-time lawyers. They have thousands of volunteer lawyers all around the country that could help you. So that's available. And, and just going to the website information, sort of like getting stopped, you know, in your car. Well, they have right on here is your rights. You have the right to remain silent, like in you know, <laughs> the TV shows. If you wish to exercise that right, say so out loud. I don't want to talk. I want to remain silent. And there's a cute little video of this if you go to YouTube and put You Know Your Rights. Uh, and the, the, there's a stand-up comic guy, uh, Elton James White, who does it. So on YouTube, Know Your Rights, uh, uh, ACLU. Uh, and the other thing is that you have the right to refuse to consent to a search of yourself, your car, or your home. Or if you're not under arrest, you have the right to leave calmly. And you have the right to a lawyer if arrested and ask for one re immediately. And regardless of your immigration or citizenship uh, status, whatever your status is in this country, you still have constitutional rights. And here's other things I, I think is even more important, how to deal with the police, because that, that's sometimes when we really get, at least a smart ass like me could really get in trouble. Uh, they, your responsibility when you're, you're stopped by anybody is to re stay calm and be polite. Do not interfere or obstruct the police. Do not lie or give false documents. Do prepare yourself and your family in case you are arrested. And do remember the details of the encounter with the police. And do file a written complaint or call your local ACLU office if you feel your rights have been violated. <laughs> so that they're even asking for business that they're going to give you for free. <laughs> That's what's so neat about uh, this country. Everything's for free almost if, if you know where to look. Um, and these are important issues and, and we live in fear because of fear of the unknown and we don't know our rights. So, uh, so when you know your rights and then you know <laughs> the known known, as Rumfeld used to say, uh, then it's easier to get through life that way. And so this is a wonderful source for knowing your rights. You got to know them. Well, I guess you figured out by now that the whole food business is changing. You know, no longer do a lot of people go to Safeway and Giant and all these and get their vegetables from, uh, you know, that's been sitting on a truck, you know, for the last two weeks coming from California or Brazil or something. That people go to farmer's markets and get better, fresher, tastier stuff that's grown just right outside the city or maybe in the city. Yeah. Well, now what's going on is that you know, these people can't be in every farmer's markets anywhere. So now their business is started and it's an easy business to start because you don't need a farm. You don't need a store. You don't need anything <laughs> that they were they, they deliver these fresh fruits and vegetables to you or they come in once or twice a week to a local area and, and you get it and they, they, they all the local products, like the guy down the street who makes great jams and jellies or mustard and ketchup and breads and all this kind of stuff. It's all on a website. You just go, hey, I want the fresh things of this or whatever, and pop, you know, it, it, it's next door to you, you know, within a day. 
You know, it's just changing everything, you know, I think. And this is what our society is becoming, a lot of change. And, and so it's same. It's good. I mean, you know, you talk to these people and you see that a farmer, so if you're growing, you know, fresh fruits or arugula or whatever that, that is locally and selling it, you know, at Safeway or whatever, man, they're only giving you like 20 cents on the dollar. Here, the farmers are getting 50, 60 cents on the dollar. So because they don't have the big organization in the middle. That's what, you know, we become such big businesses. So those big businesses have a lot of overhead. They have to pay for all that stuff. So the person doing the real work, the farmer, gets nothing. Yeah. And here, if you cut out all of that stuff, the farmer will get more and be encouraged to provide new and better and, and provide more items like this. And, and they're local, which by itself will be a lot better. So I think the whole food industry is going to change. I mean, it sounds like we're, we're going back to colonial times or whatever, but no, we have, we, we are in some respects, but it's more efficient now because we have the internet and all these other tools that are available. And also now young people are getting into farmers. I mean, now here where I live in Montgomery County, they have land set aside just for young people who want to start farming and they have money and help and things like that. You know, so people, actually one of my sons now is very interested in that. You know, we got, it's wonderful life and providing food for other people that's tasty and great. I mean, that's, you know, if you don't like being in a restaurant all day and you like working outside, man, what could be better than that? You know, so this is a business and then the people in the middle that make it all happen. If you're a geek and like food, then you want to set up a website. Because see, if you're a farmer selling food, how many farmer markets can you be in? But online, you could be there once and everybody could have access locally to your food online. So there's new hot businesses to start. You can find out about them, see how this guy did it and what it is. He's in about seven or eight markets now doing this stuff and growing like heck. So watch it. There's a lot of changes happening in the food industry. Who knows what's going to happen to Safeway? <laughs> They're going to be left to selling milk. Well, Grisha Kramer, man, and I think you got one of the hottest ideas in this country, man. You're you're like in what six or nine cities already? Yeah, um, yeah. it's not necessarily my idea. It's actually Zach yeah. Butler and Arnie Katz's <laughs> idea. But I um, see. They, they are very, well, very you're exciting. there helping out with that. But RelayFoods.com. Now, what you do is like it's all local food and local processors or you know uh, uh, hip specialty food items just for your area. That, but you create like a, uh, it's like a farmer's market online for all your local food, and then you deliver it so I don't have to get my butt out of the house at all. <laughs> yeah, and it, right. we do deliver it to your door for $12. Like our website is very much like there is a farmer's market right next to a grocery store, and if you uh -huh. made, you know, hot sauce in a way that the FDA approved of, you could sell it in the parking lot. Um, that would be our website, but yes, like you said, we'll deliver it for $12. But most of our customers use pickups. They like to get out of the house. Ah, uh, I long. see. And so that's, a, a, that's a truck that your groceries a, are waiting oh, for. Oh, so the, the, the truck somewhere in the neighborhood will come like once a week or something like that? Is that what it yes. is? So yeah. there's several spots a day. They sit there from three to seven generally. Usually it's one or two times a week. Uh -huh. And the idea is, you know, you're usually only doing your grocery shopping that often. You go to the I truck, see. you pick up your groceries. Uh -huh. You don't have to bring your children inside a physical grocery store and there's no candy aisle. So <laughs> that, that makes life a little easier for parents. So at least. And then you pick up just what you need, you know, uh, instead of buying all this other crap or, or getting crap for the kid to <laughs> get diabetes from or whatever the heck, <laughs> yeah, with all that stuff. Well, that's terrific. So you, you, but the most important thing about this is you're getting locally produced food picked from the farm yesterday on your table today kind of thing, right? Yeah, so the idea is, you know, it's 2014, and I don't know why, you know, it took so long for the American farmer to be online in effective yeah. way. That's what we're trying to do at Relay, and make it so, you know, if you work on Saturdays, or if you just want to sleep right through the farmer's market, we're, we're there for you, and you can order the food online, and then it will be waiting for you on a truck the next day, or we will bring it straight to your door. Ah. Well, that, I mean, that's true. These farmers market, I mean, they look interesting, but but number one, you know, they're my, and I'm in Washington, D.C. We must have like 50 farmers markets in the area. So if I'm making my great James and uh, jams and jellies, I can't be at 50 places at one time. Right. But 
but here on your website, I could be 50 places, or I could visit 50, you know, uh, farmers markets all from my kitchen table. <laughs> exactly. So like as a farmer, you know, you can't sell everything you make at a farmer's market. You have right. to sell some of it to grocery stores and we, yeah. you know, committed to paying far, far more than grocery stores for, for ah, farm. Well, that's so, another benefit, but you guys are doing it, helping local farmers get better money for their food, right? Because you said earlier before we talked, you said like a local farmer only gets like what, 10, 20 cents on a dollar for it. Yeah. And, and you're giving the farmer 60 cents on a dollar? Man, you're gonna start a revolution. <laughs> well, that's, that's the idea is to take, you know, take these people, pay them, pay them a fair wage. And that way, if, you're, if eating local is something you're interested in, you can spend your money locally and keep your money in the local economy. Ah, yeah. And, you know, the food doesn't travel as far and it's a lot of it is much, much tastier. So your radishes have been sitting on a truck for a week and a half, right? <laughs> exactly. So it's here today, gone tomorrow, but right. you know, it's that much fresher. Ah. Oh, that's cool. And it's also about local, uh, what do you call it, specialty food items that are made locally? I mean, you, you, when we were talking earlier, you said about, you know, the guy has this uh, barbecue sauce he's making in his basement and his wife hates him for it. He can contact yeah. you and get a distribution for it, right? And make 60 cents on the dollar. Yeah, so it's, it's one of my favorite stories is this guy in Charlottesville who makes Bone Doctor's barbecue sauce. You know, he started selling it to fund his daughter's Little League team. He was just making it for fun. Uh, and it see. kept selling, and now he's selling it to us, so now he can sell it in Charlottesville, Washington, D.C., you know, Lynchburg, wow. or Harrisonburg, Durham, North Carolina, wow. Raleigh, North Carolina, you know. There's there's a bunch of other places that people, you know, can get access to that stuff. And it's it's so, pretty so good. So you're, you're like the... Uh uh amazon for local fresh food right i go to i go to amazon for all the books or toys or whatever the hell i'm looking but for food and fresh food instead of going safeway you know, the other food's been on the truck forever i come to you and get not only you know fresh stuff but unique stuff you know yep. uh that only the i mean is this like local uh made baked goods too that you have Yep, we do have, you know, you, if your business was around and successful before we existed, we will still buy your food and sell it for a little bit more. Um, and that gives people access to, like, local bakeries. Um, there's I some see. local restaurants that we get soup from. And, ah. yeah, our, our whole business model, like you said, it's like Amazon and the farmer's market had a child, and then they all moved in. <laughs> they're rich on the grocery store and raised the child together. That child would be Relay Foods. But... <laughs> uh, now, the, so you, you get soup and stuff. So is this, like, ready-to-serve food? I mean, it's almost like catering in a way, some of it? Yeah, so places like there's there's this place, Mona Lisa Pasta in, in Charlottesville, which has, yeah. you know, great, great Italian food. Um, you know, and they will, will bring you their breadsticks, will bring you their pizza. They make the best oh. oven pizza I've ever had. Um, it was it was pretty phenomenal because you know that experience of you know you're eating an oven pizza and you know you're gonna feel exactly like an oven right. pizza. Afterwards. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was you know neither the taste of that nor the experience of that afterwards with this oven pizza it was delicious, um, which is you know that's a rare thing. Wow. So the cities you're in now, okay, Charlottesville, Washington, D.C. I'm in Washington. Like I saw you guys here, and it was great. Wonderful woman who was doing the marketing on the on 14th Street there. Nice lady. And what are the other cities? Baltimore and where else? Baltimore, um, Durham, um, excuse me, Durham and Raleigh uh -huh. in North Carolina. Um, we're also at Chapel Hill, I believe. So, And we also have a couple satellite markets, so you can still get um, this food maybe one or two days a week in Stanton and in Fishersville in uh, Harrisonburg and in Lynchburg as well. Wow. So you're covered really the Virginia area, North Carolina, Washington, D.C. And you're in Richmond too, right? Yeah, in Richmond also. Right. So you can right. get it in Stafford and Fredericksburg out near Richmond too. Ah, well, that's wonderful. It's RelayFoods.com. Get the best fresh fruits, vegetables, and, and locally made specialty foods. Deliver to your door, or you pick up locally once a week, or once every other day, or whatever you want it. <laughs> yeah. And it's great. And if you're a local food guy or a local, you know, farmer, you want to know about you guys too, right? Because you give, you you have the best payouts in the business. You know, Safeway yeah. is not going to match you guys, right? And, and unlike most services like this, it's it's a la carte. You don't it, like Amazon. You don't pay anything for an account with us. You order food ah, when you want to. So people can order, like I personally, you know, I, I do some shopping at the grocery store, but I use Relay to get like meats, um, chocolate bars. I get a big, big bag of yogurt pretzels that oh, I would really? Wonderful. Yeah, yeah no, I'm so gonna look. Used, 
you know, to replace the grocery store or right. just, you know, to get something nice every once in a while. Right. So it's kind of not, you know, it's not a big investment with us. So I don't have to like some of these farm cooperative. I mean, I have to, you know, buy for a year every month or something like that. So it's just, as you say, a la carte. So yeah. <laughs> I don't want the prepackaged meal. I just want to pay for what I want now. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole idea. Because you know, until this most sort of ways to get farm to table food was a long right. investment, then you were going to get maybe more food from the farm than you wanted. Right. Um, exactly. Every... So now, what are we going to do with all these exactly. mushrooms? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Grisha. Thanks that you're there and uh, you know, you're inspired to help this business grow because it sounds like something we really need and the world is changing and you're part of it. So thank you for being there. Yeah. That's reallyfoods.com. Take care. Now here's two guys that are really my hero. I mean, they outdid me in taking government information and making money out of it. Man, now what they did, they found a book in the government that's over like 45 years old, you know, and they put it on the internet and made almost $800,000 doing it. Man, and it's an esoteric little book that, you know, you say, who the heck would buy that or whatever but there's 6,500 people who put up a total of eight hundred thousand dollars because they want them to take that book they found in the government <laughs> and actually it was by the uh, the transit agency of New York City is a graphic design book for all the signs you know in the subway in New York now when you look at that now who the hell would want that right you would say well 800,000 people, dollars worth, you know, $800,000 they got for this book that they're going to reproduce that was made in 1970, somewhere around there, you know, and they're going to republish it, you know. Man, see, I mean, this, this is what I did. Actually, I went to the government printing office one day in about 1970 or 80 or something like that and found a book there by the government and took it because, see, nothing in the government is copyrighted and reprinted it, you know, and, and it became a New York Times bestseller. See, there's so many different ways, but I think what they show you more than I did, mine was for the general public. I think what's important about what the internet has and what they have shown you is that small markets, individual markets are so important. Look at almost a million dollars worth of importance that they found for a book that everyone would just walk right by and didn't care. But see, when you go on the internet, the internet, it's so easy to segment and find people that are just small groups of people. You don't need, there's 300 and some million people in this country, but look at 6,000 only, you know, were enough to get them $800,000, you know, almost a million dollars. So you don't need, you know, to appeal to everyone. You don't need a Walmart stuff, you know, or some millions and real cheap and things like that. No, now there's markets for specific little ideas. And it's easier to find them now on the internet than anything else. And they went on a crowdfunding site you know, and, and the crowdfunding site found most of them for them, you know. So that's what it is. It's so much easier to sell niche items now. This is why I think mass production is probably over. We all are sick and tired of everybody having the same thing. Now you're able to get specific things just for you. Question mark suits. I used to have to make, I still haven't made my myself because I can't find them in stores. Yeah. And now it'll become easier and easier like that because the market, you don't have to go to a big company. See if a big company, a big publisher says, you know, oh, you know, we need to sell a hundred thousand books, you know, and there's not a book market for that because they have such an overhead that they have to finance all the people and accounting and distribution and everything. But you're yourself. A million bucks is good enough, right? You don't need a hundred million dollars. A million dollars is good enough because there's just you. And that's what the internet provides. See, I, I sort of see it as, well, you're, you're a cockroach. I mean, see the cockroaches, the small little guys, like the cockroaches in society, cockroaches were, I think, here before the dinosaurs even. Dinosaurs are gone, cockroaches are here because they live off crumbs. That's right, the big companies that need billions and billions of dollars to survive, so they won't touch anything unless there's billions of dollars involved in it. Well, you, 
or me, hey, there's a half a million here, a million there. Pretty soon you got some serious money, right? <laughs> and the big guys don't even bother. So the bigger these organizations get, the more they leave crumbs that are so huge for the rest of us to live in. And then we don't have to work in those big bureaucracies. So watch how these guys did it. It's fun. Well, Jesse Reed and Hammond, <laughs> Hammond Smythe, and that's with an M, right? But everybody knew that. Uh, but more importantly, I don't know, you guys have, like, uh, it's a manual for when they built the subway and for the graphics, a graphic manual. It looks like an industrial book that you now made an international bestseller, raised over you know, uh, three quarters of a million dollars on it, and, and you copied the whole thing. That's what I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel a little, little guilty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you plagiarize. That's what I do. I took government documents, plagiarize them, and make a lot of money. We have, so, we have so permission. You still, <laughs> oh, you have permission. Well, that's incredible. But, I mean, it, it is important work. I mean, th this is uh, the signs and how they develop the signs to get us in the most complicated subway of the system in the world. That's no longer complicated, is it? Yeah. It is amazing. We're pretty shocked um, as to why people would be interested in this. As graphic designers, we know why we're interested in this yeah. stuff because it's it's interesting to our profession. But um, we've been, I think we've sort of tapped into um, the the New Yorkers' love of the subway mm -hmm. um, and perhaps um, the the more mainstream uh, you know market. <laughs> well, what, what, can you tell how many are from New York, how many sales now? You've got about six, 7,000 sales already. So, I mean, what percentage of that are New Yorkers? I mean, is it 90% or maybe? Yeah, we can't tell how many are from New York. We can see how many are from the U.S., from Europe, ah. different parts of the world. So that's still pretty interesting. I mean, the majority is from the U.S., uh, but once we get all the addresses in to start sending out the books right, and we then you'll be able to tell to right run exactly. down. it will be interesting to see yeah what the percentage of new york city people versus yeah. the rest of the country right. but now in you know three quarters of a million dollars i mean that's a big jackpot it sounds like to me and, and did you have like a marketing company or you know a big pr firm help you and stuff uh, like uh, that we had a we had a lot of help from um a, a startup a small company called uh, Van Alexandra. Uh, it's vanalexandra.com. Uh, and they're a small company in New York uh, run by a woman, Alex Daly. Uh, and, and she runs, she manages Kickstarter campaigns. And ah, campaigns. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Has a history in film and fundraising. And they did an amazing job working with us to write press releases, um, uh -huh. you know, tweet at people, mm -hmm. get, the, get the word out on Twitter. And they also sort of help us message people on Kickstarter. We get a lot of messages. Um, yeah. from people, you know, how do I enter my address, that sort of thing. <laughs> with, with that help, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But what's great is, I mean, talking about, like, advertising and marketing, we didn't pay, like, we didn't take out ads anywhere to pay for advertising. So the fact that we really did all of this through a real push of, you know, social media, word of mouth, and really contacting specific people in the beginning that we thought would be interested and then they mm -hmm. kind of it goes on from there is a really kind of key, the key that got yeah. us to so many different outlets so originally you, you were hoping for a hundred grand and that would get you down the road you need to uh, like to print 500 or a thousand and it's going to be printed in italy i mean that sounds sexy man. Yeah, yeah, that sounds sexy. Sexy. <laughs> for a manual that's printed in italy <laughs> yeah italy has, italy's sort of known as the finest art book printing yeah that's what yeah, i think we wanted to print there for sure but it's also nice because uh massimo vignelli uh the designer of the manual is is italian so. yeah and uh, the company that he worked for when he designed this him and bob norder you know they had a milan office so and it's very oh i company. see so i think yeah. it's right just to kind of tie in not just doing everything in the u.s for the sake of doing yeah. it but really you know finding these different sources all around the world to help put this book together have it more organic or more authentic or uh, whatever. Yeah, 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 a little bit, yeah. yeah. Is he still alive or what? Actually, he passed away only months ago. Uh, really? Yeah, so, so he knew this was coming anyway, huh? Well, yeah. Um, we didn't time this yeah. with that, obviously. Um, no, I mean, we made the website um, putting all these images online about two years ago. I and see. it really just got up to this point, you know, six months ago or however long it was that we started to really float the idea of making a book. 
Um, yeah, and unfortunately, he passed away a few months ago. Oh, so oh, um, he probably knew about the the, the website that we did, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's too bad he won't be able to see the book. But um, you know, we've talked with his uh, his children, and they're very you know son and daughter, and they're very supportive. Oh, wonderful! Right. Well, he's carrying his life on now, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, was, they, he was always big on education and yeah. design education. So uh, his son Luca thinks that he would have been uh, right. very well, happy with this project. Yeah. Well, it's so great for you guys doing this and really educating us about design, which we all need. We all appreciate it so much. And I don't know why the average person doesn't seem to get into it more and realize or even demand it. Yeah. So, so we're ask yourselves every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you guys, get, you guys get all the fun at it because you're doing it. See? Yeah. <laughs> so you have a, a chance to be involved in it every day and the rest of us. You know, I mean, I, I just think it makes your life so much better if you're surrounded by things of beauty and designed well and feels better. And to, to find an object or a, or a publication or a book that has been considered by somebody, it's, yeah. a, it's a beautiful thing, you know, yeah. to pick up a pen that is beautifully designed and right. to, to know that somebody spent uh, probably yeah. months, you know, crafting that pen. is a, Yeah. It's a good feeling. But that, that's what's so great about this manual is that people maybe didn't realize before that every single day, all day long, they're surrounded by this amazingly designed yeah. piece of work that they thought was just, you know, put up by some right. uh, engineer <laughs> or some sign maker. But these things were so considered, even yeah. down to the each individual letter that was considered to be, you know, designed. And so um, people are surrounded by really great design a lot more than they probably Yeah, they, well, we don't appreciate, you know, or, or take the time to appreciate. It's sort of like a good mate. You know, sometimes you don't take the time to appreciate your mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and how much they're really doing for you in life. So that's what's so nice. I mean, you guys are stopping us in our dead tracks and say, hey, look at this. It's great. These, these people spent so much time figuring this out, and you, you take it for granted every day. Yeah. So it's, Thank you for making our life more special, and it's great to see work like this, and it's great to see people like that get honored with real money, man. <laughs> so actually, to find the book, so uh, go to Kickstarter, and uh, the Standards Manual, that's plural for the Standards Manual, and get it on Kickstarter while it's still there, and it'll be there for a while. <laughs> and then it'll be coming from Italy, and great, you'll have it for Christmas. Yeah, in Italy. It ends on uh, October 10, so I think as of to, as of this recording, there's uh, 12 days to go. I right. Think. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, even if it's not, they'll find you after that day because this will be up for a while. Great. Well, thank you guys, and I'll send you some colorful shirts. So. Oh, thank I you. love it. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Now here's a nice fellow I want you to meet. Uh, I mean, he was struggling, and you know, he was doing a normal kind of job, working for people uh, as a designer and a graphic designer. And what he was feeling, because the the work he was doing, I guess, wasn't inspiring him enough. What he wanted to do was something that would help him be more creative. So he always had a fascination with skulls, you know, inside your head, skulls. So he decided to help his creativity, he would do something with skulls every day for an entire year. So 365, whether it's drawings, whether it's cutouts, whether it's photographs, anything to do with skulls. He even took his own x-ray of his skull and, and did something with that. So, I mean, you have to, I think, practice doing anything that you really want to do. I mean, if you're a golfer, if you play baseball, you just can't sit home and dream about it, right? You, you have to be doing it because that leads to improvement and to ideas that you never thought. I mean, it's all, whether it's, you know, a skill like that or art, it's all, you have to do something to get to something else. And you can't just get from here to Z, you have to go through B, C, D, E, all, all the alphabet to be able to grow in life. And so that's why what he was clever enough to do every day, he was going to do something that he was you know, very concerned about and wanted to grow in, which is his creativity. And so he did something with skulls every single day. So if he took a half hour, an hour, or whatever the heck it was, you know, it beats watching some stupid TV show, right? 
So that's what he did. Now, then he got all these 365 skulls and he said, Gee, I think there's a book here. Well, the traditional publishing industry, yeah, <laughs> it's not an exciting event. Well, I'm going to do a book with 300 different pictures of skulls on it or something. Yeah, they just not weren't interested at all. So he decided to do it himself and went on the internet and got over $17,000 to do this to have a book on 365 different <laughs> pictures of skulls. Now, who would have thought? See, and that's why you see, it, it's another indication, no matter how weird you think what you're doing is, it really isn't weird to enough people that makes it worthwhile doing. And that's the key in life. I mean, we don't have time or the energy to love every person but we want to be able to love a few or one or whatever it is. The same way with your work. You know, you can't please everybody with your work. But there's enough. Now it's enough not only to live on, but you can reach them, you know, with the Internet. You know, you can reach the, you know, 413 people that he wanted to get. He didn't need 300 million people. He didn't need to please everybody in the universe. He just had to find those 400 people to make this idea. And actually, he only needed about half of them <laughs> to make the idea work. And that's the joy in life. You're doing something that somebody else really appreciates. You know, and that's the biggest satisfaction I have when I'm walking down the street. It's not what people think. You know, they like the suit or they hate it. <laughs> but if they like it or whatever. But it's that, hey, keep up what you're doing. And that what we all should try to feel because that means what you're doing in life is worthwhile to somebody else and that's what we're here for to help somebody else so that's why the internet makes that possible so here's a guy who wants to make a book with 365 different skulls in it and there's 400 people that said hey i like that keep up your good work you know what could be better than that so watch him. He's a good guy otherwise. And uh, actually, he's got a hand tattoo like I did. I was showing mine because I'm an old guy. And he said, yeah, he did it too. <laughs> so, so watch that. It's fun. Well, Noah Scanlon with Skulladay.com. And that's skull like in the head, right? <laughs> and you actually made a career now out of an effort you had in, in, in jump-starting your own creativity by right. creating a new skull every day. And now, but you're on the internet, that's what I want to talk about, that you're making money selling a book on your skull of days, right? That's right. <laughs> Well, so now you want to have a book, and so instead of using traditional publishers, which you had in the past, you're using the internet. And, and why is the internet better for you to get money for your book than? You know, well, you, you know, I mean, having having published many books in the past using publishers, you know, it was an interesting experience, but it was frustrating because I had very little control over the outcome. Uh, and and by switching to you know self publishing and using Kickstarter, working with a, a local business to to create a book. All of those tools helped me make a book that's exactly what I wanted instead of, you know, feeling like it was something that was kind of what I wanted, but not exactly that other people had control over and also, you know, limited the amount I could make off of it. Because in the end, they right. were going to take the majority of the money from, right. from producing it and I could get, you know, a much better deal from it. Uh, so it really was uh, for freedom more than anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And you're really getting most all of it funded by the Internet. So these are people who are pre-buying, right, your book. Yeah, that was the way we thought about it, is that, you know, mm -hmm. we were going to put up the money to make it ourselves, but this way we don't have to worry about, yeah. well, will this book sell? You can find out in advance, is there an audience? Do people have an interest in this book? Yeah. By selling it in advance through Kickstarter, we raised the money to pay for a good chunk of what we needed in terms of wow. printing. And there's still a lot more money involved in right. the whole process, but that yeah. money then guarantees it's, that it's that gonna book get done. isn't going to sit on a shelf, that people yeah. and that people want it, you know, right. that well, there's you, interest or buzz about it. <laughs> you don't have to publish and then find out. <laughs> right, exactly. And then hope while you're sitting on right, boxes exactly. books going, please buy but, my book. Yeah. But more importantly, you have you know, the book, no matter what happens, and money to, uh, to do it that you didn't have to dig in your own pocket. Have you done something like crowdfunding before? Was this your first crowdfunding? 
this was actually the first time I'd been kind of waiting to do it because I thought, uh -huh. you know, I don't want to, I don't want to blow this experience this first time when, you know, because I realized that a lot of the people that were going to participate were going to be friends and family initially, and then right. hopefully we'd get out to other people. But, you know, there's only so many times I wanted to tap them. And so for my first one, I wanted I to really make it something big and I took a while to do it. Um, and I'm glad I did because I got to observe how other people did theirs and get a lot of um, uh, ex you know that helped me a lot because right. I could see where did they do well, what would, what was the technique, what did they need to do to make it a successful Kickstarter? Because it's not you know something where you can just make a Kickstarter, put it on their website, and step back and it's going to fund just itself. It doesn't go to work. The bank, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get, get the, the money, money go to the it. bank. Get the yeah. money, go to the. No. So what do no. you? Okay, at that part when you said, and by the way, in, in building the site and everything, that cost you a lot of money and. and no, no. The, the site, you know, it's funny, we actually, when I was working with my partner Ward on uh -huh. making this project, we had, we had sort of thought, well, maybe we'll hire a film crew to make right. a video for us, because that's so supposed to be very important, the video. And then the guys came back to us with thousands of dollars, and we right. thought, you know, we're going to spend all the money we make on Kickstarter paying those guys. So <laughs> I just took my camera, and I set it up on a tripod and shot some video and wow. edited it on, you know, on the Apple, I have the, right. the, the, you know, the program to edit right. video, super basic. And it was great. People loved it. Nobody worried that it wasn't like perfect, and and it was fine. And it was more that we had a video. It didn't have right. to be great. There was no special exactly. effects needed. It was just, hey, you can see what we're doing, and that was sufficient. And so yeah, we didn't spend a dime actually on it. It was, I mean, my time, which is valuable. Yeah. Certainly, and how about in marketing on the web? And once the the site was up, did you spend money to you know in social media and and the experts and professional expertise, buying advertising, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. No, no, no advertising. No. The market people paid. Uh, again, you know, I benefit from the fact that I have some skills already and right. I knew how to market and I'd done my research, which, right. I, you know, again, you don't have to be a marketer, but you certainly need to look at what's yes. involved. I promoted and I was making a list of this, but, you know, every day there would be at least one or two times on Twitter. Uh, I would be on, on Instagram making photos saying, I've got this Kickstarter. Here's how to support it. The link is over uh. here. I'd be on Facebook every day telling my friends I'd make invitations, join the Kickstarter, help me out. I sent emails every week to friends to to you know mailing lists I developed. I mean, I was working hard, so the yeah. the money is my time, right? It's not the right the exactly. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. but in the end, I have the time. I can do it, and um, it was that effort that made the difference, right? That got people donating. And if you look at you know all the Kickstarters have this little grid, and they show you the chart of the money coming in, and it's I down see, you right. know, the first day and whatever. And so the first day, there's a little blip, and then it goes like this. Uh, and you can watch that line and say, you know what, I'm not going to hit them. How are we going to get to this point? And every day goes a little bit. And then the very last day, everyone donates, and then it goes like that. And it goes up. Uh, <laughs> and so you realize, like, people procrastinate, you know. And so you have to do that effort and make that work to make so, it happen. So you have to be a professional nudge or a professional pain in the ass guy or whatever it is. Yes, yes. You, can't be, you can't be shy. If you're going to do you a can't be shy. you have to be a self-promoter. And anybody self has the, we all have the skills to do that, right? Yeah, everybody does. Well, certainly. You know, I think that people have been told not to. I think people have been like, oh, yeah. don't, you know, oh. talk about yourself or don't, you know, they feel uncomfortable. And when people ask me about it, they said, well, do you feel uncomfortable if your friend asked you about supporting a project and they say yeah. oh no i don't mind if oh, my friend exactly tells me right. every day but then they have to do it they're scared and i say I that's see. the thing look what other people do that you don't mind and uh -huh. do that that you do know. that yeah. yeah well that's wonderful so so you have very little money uh, and you have complete control of your project yeah. but i i hear you're going to do another project soon or what uh i'm i'm always in the midst of projects really? <laughs> I, I mean, this is I, I'm a, I'm one of those people who needs something else to do. I always have a project running, and Scala Day is an interesting project because, you know, I started that project. It was it was a seven seven years ago was when I started doing wow. Scala Day. I did it for a year. Everything that I've done since then has been somehow related to that project, and then I've slowly developed new things. And this book is kind of amazing because. Here's this project that's now old by internet standards, but because there's still an audience, there's still an interest, right. people are fascinated by it. Uh, and here's my friend who's saying, I want to publish this book. Here's Kickstarter as an opportunity to raise funds for it. That's, you know, a newer opportunity. So it's great. And, and you know, that book is is a culmination of that project. But then I'm I'm always, I'm literally, yeah. I mean, I couldn't even tell you. I have so many things well, I mean, going it, on it, all at the same to time. To me, what you're showing is that anybody practically, you know, could find a, a little market niche. I mean, you need 500, 600 people. That's yeah. all. <laughs> and, and you're and in business. Point, yeah. You know, that, that my project um, has a large audience online. But if you look uh -huh. at Kickstarter, it's it, we had a little over 400 backers that right. got us to the amount we needed to get to. And I looked at 
lots of successful projects. And aside from the real outliers, you know, right. there's some big ones. Right. But the average one that was successful, regardless of if they were asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars or a few thousand, three to six hundred yeah. people. That's well, not a lot of people. Exactly. You, three I mean, to people, you need but, millions on a bestseller list, but you yeah. can be successful and sustainable with yeah. a couple hundred. So yeah. why screw around with those people in New York? <laughs> yeah. And the bonus is, look, you might have the project that does get it blow exactly. up tons right. of people, but if you don't, you can still get Exactly. You know, you're still make doing something what, happen. And you know, make do, yourself doing what you want to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do something that you're passionate about, and that you're not spending your time begging people, you yeah. know, or trying to to create what you think people like. Absolutely. I think that's a problem. It's like you're talking you know, to the horse's <laughs> mouth instead of some fat cat with a cigar in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's wonderful, Noah. And so to get Skull a Day, it's skulladay.com, and that's, that's really a beautiful picture book. Of the skulls you made in That's various right. art forms for 365 days, right? So it wasn't yeah. a leap year. Huh? No. And then it was a leap year, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, people wanted me to make one more, and I made a tiny little one just to satisfy the quarter of the day. But, and when I say making a skull, you know, to be clear, what I was making was art that was out of anything and everything. Yes. So we're talking about butterflies, oh. shoes, sheets from beds. I mean, it was not oh, like no, what you consider beautiful. like, you know, a drawing yeah. of a skull. This was well, you, really you can all see over the, the place. video by going to the skulladay.com and clicking yeah. and, and that gets you the, the video on this stuff. And that's right. No, you're right. I mean, that's right. I think just to see what you're able, how you can be creative 365 ways. I mean, yeah. That that's education enough. Even if they don't buy the book, man, you gotta you go. see well, it. Really somebody encourage people to, to, yeah. to check out what I did, but then you know, try it out themselves. Yeah. If you make something, a little thing, it doesn't have to be huge, yeah. doesn't have to be complicated, a little bit every day. Yeah. If you're making creative work, you're gonna be getting yourself on a path to right. going and doing some amazing things. And I started very small. The first day was twenty minutes, and by the end I was doing <laughs> things that took tons of hours, and now here I am today successful in business because of making skulls so, uh, not yeah. something i ever would have expected yeah. really i spend my time talking to you know executives of corporations now right. who want to hear <laughs> they're from coming to you for the I answers and you yeah. didn't know them when you started but they think you know them now yeah. <laughs> well wonderful though and thank you for being there and sharing Thanks your creativity so with everybody at skulladay.com and at thank least you. see those 365 things of way different ways to display a skull <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Well, did you ever see like a new product that comes out or a new idea? And you look at that and you say, gosh, why didn't I think of that? It's so simple, it's so easy. <laughs> and it looks like so much fun. You know, and I could have done that. And you can. See, and, and that's what's neat. And I think most of us don't because we think, oh, the process of going and how am I going to get money? How am I going to do this? How am I going to, you know, find people to give me money for this thing when I do it? And see, that's changed. You know, and you watch this video and you see how this guy, you know, he was sort of like, a, I always played ping pong. And I like playing ping pong. And you know, like at your dinner table or whatever, and, and he would get this net and all this nonsense or whatever and try to put the net on the t dinner table so that he could play ping pong with his guests after dinner. And isn't that a great idea? Instead of having a big ping pong table to do it. But he couldn't find a good net. You know, all those nets you wrap around, and it's all screwed up and everything. So he took pieces of cork, you know, really lightweight cork, cut in half, designed it so they don't tip over, and just takes these two pieces of corks and puts them on the table, gets ping pong better, and they play ping pong right after dinner. Man, what a terrific idea. So, he, and it's easy to do. He found a market $20,000. He put the idea on the website, yeah, on the internet and crowdfunding, and he got $20,000 to make that happen. Okay, so he worked on the design. We all like tinkering around and, and making something special for somebody else. And, and so this would be for the public. So taking your idea, not complicated, not a lot of technology and nonsense. No, just two, <laughs> it looks like two pieces of wood, but they're not, they're cork. Because there's a lot nicer and lighter and everything uh, than wood for this stuff. See, you can do these kinds of things today. You don't have to sit and watch stupid TV at night anymore. You know, you can go down and work on your idea and think about it and try to make it better and take your rough drawings out to other people. Hey, what do you think of this? You know, or you could even go in a, a chat room and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this and, and get input and ideas. 
I mean, the world is sitting right here for all the help, and, and it's free. People come in and free. People help you for free. You don't know, hey, what's the best material? You know, there's so much free help you could get for things like that. You join the local makers. I mean, you know, these makers, you use Google makers, and you see these organizations that are really free. They may charge a monthly fee of $50 or something to be long or something. But these are all people like you that want to do things. And these things are growing all over because we new ideas are what it's all about. The old stuff doesn't work anymore. So your ideas are just as good as anybody else, but you gotta do something with them. The only difference between you and this guy with the cork, he did something about it. So watch him, but be inspired about how you're gonna take your idea and do something with it too, because even if you fail, big deal, that will lead to something even better that you should have thought in the first place, and it cost you almost nothing to try it. Well, Julian Bond, what a great name, <laughs> with corknet.com. But actually, Julian, you just finished a Kickstarter campaign, which has the neatest thing I think I've ever seen. You know, I'm studying Mandarin, so I'm, I'm really in the Chinese culture, and I've been studying with uh, some Chinese tutors here, and they're all you know, immigrants here, and I took them to play ping pong for the first time, and they whipped my butt, man, these old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> And now I can get your product in my kitchen and practice. See, that's what I have to do is practice my ping pong so exactly. I can keep up with my Chinese. But you invented this great product, right, that is actually a, a table protector and becomes a ping pong net on your kitchen table or actually any kind of table, right? Exactly. Yeah, no, that's the, the whole idea of getting it, getting it into everybody's house. You know, everybody has a table somewhere. So why not use it for more than one purpose? I mean, <laughs> clear the tables off and have a game hey, of ping pong. Right. And, and, and it's actually more of a conversation piece too. I mean, this is really cool because you put pots on it, you know, when you're not using it at it, uh, as a, a table, uh, as, as the, the net, you know, for ping pong. Yeah. But more importantly, I remember all those nets, we used to have a ping pong table on the bottom, and it's all going to get curled up, and it take 20, 30 minutes to unravel the damn thing. And yeah. here you just have two little boards. You have a, a, a copy of one there? Or, it's, uh, it's just a simple, well, it's a solid yeah. piece of cork. Ah, so it's and, very lightweight, and there's yeah, two of them, and you put them next to each other. Ah, I see. And that's how they become flat to use as a table protector. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, it could not be simpler. I mean, I've seen, I did research into different nets and stuff because I, I played table tennis on my own kitchen table and. Ah, you, a, you did it with a real net or you yeah, books or something? Or? Oh, I know we used, um, I went out and bought just a, a cheap set with the net and stuff, which I was not for a normal size table tennis table, which is huge compared to a normal <laughs> kitchen table. So, you know, you have to wrap it around. Yeah, make a oh, mess, right. Yeah. And it's all going everywhere. And, and I, I was looking around, okay, I need to find something that's much easier and isn't a pain in the ass to put away and, <laughs> and everything. And I thought, okay, there is stuff here, but it's not, it doesn't look nice. It's just, it's still a piece of sports equipment. And right. It's like I've, putting a, a sneaker on the table or something. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, here you have a, a piece of, of dinner or kitchen paraphernalia or whatever that yeah. looks comfortable on any table exactly yeah that's the that's the whole idea i mean cork is i think in everybody's kitchens already yeah. as a as a heat mat or or something or to keep the wine table. inside the bottle or whatever yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's not yeah that's in everybody's kitchen for sure yeah. <laughs> no it's wonderful and are you a, a, a ping pong aficionado is that why you did it or, or just a bored dad and no, trying I'm, to not, keep a, the I'm kid? not a dad for sure oh i see okay <laughs> i'm just uh no it's just a, i i used to just play with my my housemates and my friends when they came I around see. i mean it's just a really good fun to do yeah. good thing to do um yeah i mean i'm not a i'm not a, a champion table tennis player or anything like that uh, but i mean i played at school when i was younger and and every now and again actually i don't know where i think i probably the last time i properly played before i i played a year ago was at school which was oh, a long really? time ago so. no, wow 
<laughs> well, in China, my people, my friends from China, I mean, they started like third grade or something, and they play all the time. And these ladies said that's the only sport they've ever played. Yeah, is ping pong. Yeah, and so they were delighted when I showed them ping pong. So now, when I'm, I, I got to get one of these for home. So when they come over for dinner, man. I'm gonna play with these Chinese people. <laughs> <laughs> so I got that. And they're good, man. They just swack that that I can. So that's courtnet.com. Yeah, Julian... or, or .co.uk. I think it goes uh, to both. Oh, really? Okay. Or, or courtnet.co.uk. .co.uk or .com. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, Julian, thank you so much and good luck with your tennis. I'm going to come over and beat you after I get your <laughs> net here. I'm going to practice on this dining room table and whip your butt when I get to the UK. Take Sounds care. Sounds good. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye -bye.